Hi, I'm Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I would like a moment of your time because I wanted you to know something. I wanted you to know about Dr. Milton Friedman's TV series, Free to Choose. I truly believe that the series has changed my life. And when you have such a powerful experience as that, I think you shouldn't keep it to yourself. So I wanted to share it with you. Being free to choose for me means being free to make your own decisions, free to live your own life, pursue your own goals, chase your own rainbow, without the government breathing down on your neck or standing on your shoes. For me, that meant coming here to America, because I came from a socialistic country where the government controls the economy. It's a place where you can hear 18-year-old kids already talking about their pension. But me, I wanted more. I wanted to be the best. Individualism like that is incompatible with socialism. So I felt I had to come to America. I had no money in my pocket, but here I had the freedom to get it. I've been able to parlay my big muscles into big business and a big movie career. And along the way, I was able to save and invest. And I watched America change. And I noticed this that the more the government interfered and intervened and inserted itself into the free market, the worse the country did. But when the government stepped back and let the free enterprise system do its work, then the better we did, the more robust our economy grew, the better I did, and the better my business grew, and the more I was able to hire and help others. Okay. So there I was in Palm Springs, waiting for Maria to get ready so we could go out for a game of mixed doubles. I started zipping through the television dial, and I caught a glimpse of Nobel Prize winner economist Dr. Milton Friedman. I recognized him from the starting of my own degree in economics and business, but I didn't know I was watching Free to Choose. It knocked me out. Dr. Friedman expressed, validated, and explained everything I ever thought or experienced or observed about the way the economy works. And I guess I was really ready to hear it. He said, the economic race should not be arranged so that everyone ends at the finish line at the same time, but so that everyone starts at the starting line at the same time. Wow. I would like to ride that one home to Austria. He said, that society that puts equality before freedom winds up with neither. But that society puts freedom before equality will end up with a great measure of both. Boy, if I would have come up with that one myself, I maybe wouldn't have had to get into bodybuilding. <laughs> when I did beef up my bodybuilding in business school, of course I started what Thomas Jefferson believed and what Adam Smith thought and even what Milton Friedman had to say. But with free to choose, it all came together. Their economic thought with my own personal experience. In a way, I felt I'd come home. I sought out Dr. Friedman and had the great pleasure and privilege of meeting him and his economist wife, Rose. And we've all become friends, and now I call him Milton. And that became a big pain in the neck about free to choose. All my friends and acquaintances got the tapes and the books for Christmas after Christmas all the way through the Reagan years when I was able to tell them all, you see, Milton is right. And I think it's crucial that we all keep moving in the same direction, away from socialism and towards greater freedom and opportunity. That's why I'm so excited that Milton Friedman is updating Free to Choose, bringing it into the 90s by discussing how to deal with the drug disaster, the Japan phenomenon, and of course, the miserable failure of communism. Oh, by the way, there are plans now to translate free to choose into the languages of the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. And you know, they really need it to guide them through as to take the first walk into freedom. But we need it too. I recommend you the new TV series Free to Choose and encourage you to walk into the 21st century in freedom, in opportunity, and in success with Dr. Milton Friedman. Thanks for listening. Human and political freedom has never existed and cannot exist without a large measure of economic freedom. Freedom is making choices. What's best for me? What do I want to do? We all want to be free to choose. 
No government official is telling these people what to do. Parental control. Parents choosing the teacher. Parents monitoring the schooling. Free to live your own life, pursue your own goals, chase your own rainbow. Without the government breathing down on your neck or standing on your shoes. Most of us would choose prosperity if we could. But what's the best road to that goal? Free trade set off a process that revolutionized Japan and the lives of its people. The pilgrims tried a form of socialism over 300 years ago. Unfortunately for their fair-minded plans, they prospered only after they were allowed to keep for themselves all the food they grew. Who says economic institutions don't matter? We may dream of a perfect world, but we all know that's not possible. Hong Kong is very far from utopia. Life is unfair. There's nothing fair about one man being born blind and another man being born with sight. I do not know any exception to the proposition that if you compare like with like, the freer the system, the better off the ordinary poor people have been. Dr. Friedman has spent a lifetime studying freedom and prosperity. To him, the lessons of history are clear. People are better off making their own choices, better off not relying on government. Free to choose is a survival kit for you and for liberty. This morning around the New York metropolitan area, skies are sunny now. A little bit of cloudiness over the eastern end of Long Island, a patchy fog out there. Boy, we've got some lovely weather to talk about. And I think I promised you this back at the beginning of the week. Once all this was a swamp covered with forests. The Canarsie Indians who lived here traded the 22 square miles of soggy Manhattan Island to the Dutch for $24 worth of cloth and trinkets. The newcomers founded a city, New Amsterdam, at the edge of an empty continent. In the years that followed, it proved a magnet for millions of people from across the Atlantic. People who were driven by fear and poverty, who were attracted by the promise of freedom and plenty. They fanned out over the continent and built a new nation with their sweat, their enterprise, and their vision of a better future. For the first time in their lives, many were truly free to pursue their own objectives. That freedom released the human energies which created the United States. For the immigrants who were welcomed by this statue, America was truly a land of opportunity. They poured ashore in their best clothes, eager and expectant, carrying what little they owned. They were poor, but they all had a great deal of hope. Once they arrived, they found, as my parents did, not an easy life, but a very hard life. But for many, there were friends and relatives to help them get started, to help them make a home, get a job, settle down in a new country. There were many rewards for hard work, enterprise, and ability. Life was hard, but opportunity was real. There were few government programs to turn to and nobody expected them. But also, there were few rules and regulations. There were no licenses, no permits, no red tape to restrict them. They found, in fact, a free market, and most of them thrived on it. Many people still come to the United States driven by the same pressures and attracted by the same promise. You can find them in places like this. It's Chinatown in New York, one of the centers of the garment industry, a place where hundreds of thousands of newcomers have had their first taste of life in the new country. The people who live and work here are like the early settlers. They want to better their lot and they're prepared to work hard to do so. Although I haven't often been in factories like this, it's all very familiar to me because this is exactly the same kind of a factory that my mother worked in when she came to this country for the first time at the age of 14, almost 90 years ago. And if there had not been factories like this here then at which she could have started to work and earned a little money, she wouldn't have been able to come. And if I existed at all, I'd be a Russian or a Hungarian today instead of American. 
Of course, she didn't stay here a long time. She stayed here while she learned the language, while she developed some feeling for the country, and gradually she was able to make a better life for herself. Similarly, the people who are here now, they are like my mother, mostly immigrants from a distant country. They came here because they liked it here better and had more opportunities. A place like this gives them a chance to get started. They're not going to stay here very long or forever. On the contrary, they and their children will make a better life for themselves as they take advantage of the opportunities that a free market provides to them. The irony is that this place violates many of the standards that we now regard as every worker's right. It's poorly ventilated, it's overcrowded, the workers accept less than the union rate, it breaks every rule in the book. But if it were closed down, who would benefit? Certainly not the people here. Their life may seem pretty tough compared to our own, but that's only because our parents or grandparents went through that stage for us. We've been able to start at a higher point. Frank Vizzelli's father was 12 years old when he arrived all alone in the United States. He'd come from Sicily. That was 53 years ago. Frank is a successful dentist with a wife and family. They live in Lexington, Massachusetts. All right, one bottle fills the whole decanter. There's no doubt in Frank's mind what freedom combined with opportunity meant to his father and then to him, or what his Italian grandparents would think if they could see how he lives now. They would not believe what they would see, that a person could immigrate from a small island and make such success out of their life, because to them they were mostly uh, related to the, uh, the fields, working in the field as a peasant. My father came over, it was, he made something for himself and then he tried to build a family structure, whatever he did was for his family. It was for a better life for his family. And I can always remember him telling me that, you know, number one thing in life is you should get an education to become a professional person. Johnny, please don't eat that. Sorry. <laughs> the Vesali family, like all of us who live in the United States today, owe much to the climate of freedom we inherited from the founders of our country, a climate that gave full scope to the poor from other lands who came here and were able to make better lives for themselves and their children. You girls going to have this? Yeah. yeah. You, Chris? I know you don't want the whipped cream. But in the past 50 years, we've been squandering that inheritance by allowing government to control more and more of our lives instead of relying on ourselves. We need to rediscover the old truths that the immigrants knew in their bones, what economic freedom is, and the role it plays in preserving personal freedom. That's why I came here to the South China Sea. It's a place where there's an almost laboratory experiment in what happens when government is limited to its proper function and leaves people free to pursue their own objectives. Hong Kong, a place with hardly any natural resources. About the only one you can name is a great harbor. Yet the absence of natural resources hasn't prevented rapid economic development. Ships from all nations come here to trade because there are no duties, no tariffs on imports or exports. The power of the free market has enabled the industrious people of Hong Kong to transform what was once barren rock into one of the most thriving and successful places in Asia. Like America a century ago, Hong Kong in the past few decades has been a haven for people who sought the freedom to make the most of their own abilities. Many of them are refugees from countries that don't allow the economic and political freedom that's taken for granted in Hong Kong. Despite rapid population growth, despite the lack of natural resources, the standard of living is one of the highest in all of Asia. People work hard, but Hong Kong's success is not based on the exploitation of workers. Wages in Hong Kong have gone up fourfold since the war, 
and that's after allowing for inflation. The workers are free, free to work what hours they choose, free to move to other jobs if they wish. The market gives them that choice. You can be sure that somebody somewhere is willing to pay for these cheap plastic toys. Otherwise, they simply wouldn't be made. Competition from places like South Korea and Taiwan has made cheap products less profitable. So Hong Kong businessmen have been adapting. They've been developing more sophisticated products and new technology that can match anything in the West or East. And their employees have been developing new skills. It's the ordinary people of Hong Kong who benefit from all this effort and enterprise. This thriving, bustling, dynamic city has been made possible by the free market. Indeed, the freest market in the world. The free market enables people to go into any industry they want, to trade with whomever they want, to buy in the cheapest market around the world, to sell in the dearest market around the world. But, most important of all, if they fail, they bear the cost. If they succeed, they get the benefit. And it's that atmosphere of incentive that has induced them to work, to adjust, to save, to produce a miracle. This miracle hasn't been achieved by government action, by someone sitting in one of those tall buildings telling people what to do. It's been achieved by allowing the market to work. Walk down any street in Hong Kong and you'll see the impersonal forces of the market in operation. Mr. Chung makes metal containers. Nobody's ordered him to. He does it because he's found that he can do better for himself that way than by making anything else. But if demand for metal containers went down, or somebody found a way of making them cheaper, Mr. Chung would soon get that message. A few doors away, Mr. Yu's firm has been making traditional Cantonese wedding gowns for 42 years. But the demand for these elaborate garments is falling. The firm has already gotten that message, and is now looking for another product. The market tells producers not only what to produce, but how best to produce it through another set of prices. The cost of materials, the wages of labor, and so on. For example, if these workers could earn more doing something else, Mr. Ho would soon find a way to mechanize his picture frame production. Inside this Chinese medicine shop, a market transaction is going on. The customer's confidence that this painful-looking ordeal will help them doesn't rest on any official certification of the bone doctor's qualifications. It comes from experience, his own or his friends. In his turn, the doctor treats him not because he's been ordered to, but because he gets paid. The transaction is voluntary, so both parties must expect a benefit or it will not take place. Believe it or not, this backyard is the entrance to a factory. The workers here are some of the best paid in Hong Kong. It's hot, sticky, and extremely noisy. The workers are highly skilled, so they can command high wages. They could induce their employer to improve working conditions by offering to work for less. But they would rather accept the conditions, take the high wages, and spend them as they wish. That's their choice. The best known statement of the principles of a free market, the kind of free market that operates in Hong Kong, was written on the other side of the world.
200 years ago in Scotland, Adam Smith taught at the University of Glasgow. His brilliant book, The Wealth of Nations, was based on the lectures he gave here. The basic principles underlying the free market, as Adam Smith taught them to his students in this university, are really very simple. Look at this lead pencil. There's not a single person in the world who could make this pencil. Remarkable statement? Not at all. The wood from which it's made, for all I know, comes from a tree that was cut down in the state of Washington. To cut down that tree, it took a saw. To make the saw, it took steel. To make the steel, it took iron ore. This black center, we call it lead, but it's really graphite, compressed graphite. I'm not sure where it comes from, but I think it comes from some mines in South America. This red top up here, the eraser, bit of rubber, probably comes from Malaya, where the rubber tree isn't even native. It was imported from South America by some businessmen with the help of the British government. This brass ferrule, I haven't the slightest idea where it came from, or the yellow paint, or the paint that made the black lines, or the glue that holds it together. Literally thousands of people cooperated to make this pencil. People who don't speak the same language, who practice different religions, who might hate one another if they ever met. When you go down to the store and buy this pencil, you are in effect trading a few minutes of your time for a few seconds of the time of all those thousands of people. What brought them together and induced them to cooperate to make this pencil? There was no commissar sending out offices from sending out orders from some central office. It was a magic of the price system, the impersonal operation of prices that brought them together and got them to cooperate to make this pencil so that you could have it for a trifling sum. That is why the operation of the free market is so essential, not only to promote productive efficiency, but even more to foster harmony and peace among the peoples of the world. These people are crossing between two very different societies. This is Lo Wu, the official border crossing point between China and Hong Kong. On this side of the border, people are free not only in the marketplace, but in all their lives. They are free to say what they want, to write what they want, to do pretty much as they please. Not so over there. That is why people in China who cannot get permission to leave go to desperate lengths to escape. They risk their lives in the process. Many lose their lives, but that doesn't keep others from following. Some are attracted by the higher material standard of life in Hong Kong, but more by the natural human desire to be free. The people who get official permission to leave China are fortunate they're going to be able to enjoy the benefits of the economic freedom they'll find in Hong Kong. But more important, that will give them a much wider freedom. Human and political freedom has never existed and cannot exist without a large measure of economic freedom. Those of us who have been so fortunate as to have been born in a free society tend to take freedom for granted to regard it as the natural state of mankind. It is not. It is a rare and precious thing. Most people throughout history, most people today, have lived in conditions of tyranny and misery, not of freedom and prosperity. The clearest demonstration of how much people value freedom is the way they vote with their feet when they have no other way to vote. Hong Kong is very far from utopia. It has its slums, its crime, its desperately poor people. But the people are free. That's, after all, why so many of them have come here, despite having to live in leaky houseboats in one of Hong Kong's many small harbors. 
Here, they have the freedom and the opportunity to better themselves to improve their lot, and many succeed. There is an enormous amount of poverty in the world everywhere. There is no system that's perfect. There's no system that's going to eliminate completely poverty in whatever sense. The question is, which system has the greatest chance? Which is the best arrangement for enabling poor people to improve their lot? And on that, the evidence of history speaks with a single voice. I do not know any exception to the proposition that if you compare like with like, the freer the system, the better off the ordinary poor people have been. Ask yourself what it is that assures these garment workers in Hong Kong a good way, not high by Western standards, but high enough to enable them to live far better than most people in the world. It's not government or trade unions who do it. These workers do well because there's competition for their labor and skills. When a businessman faces trouble, a market threatens to disappear, or a new competitor arises, there are two things he can do. He can turn to the government for a tariff or a quota or some other restriction on competition, or he can adjust and adapt. In Hong Kong, the first option is closed. Hong Kong is too dependent on foreign trade so that the government has simply had to adopt a policy of complete non-interference. That's tough on some individuals, but it's extremely healthy for the society as a whole. Only the businessmen who can adapt, who are flexible and, ad and adjustable, survive, and they create good employment opportunities for the rest. The complete absence of tariffs or any other restrictions on trade is one of the main reasons why Hong Kong has been able to provide such a rapidly rising standard of life for its people. In all this, the government of Hong Kong has played an important part, not only by what it has done, but as much by what it has refrained from doing. It has made sure that laws are enforced and contracts honored. It has provided the conditions in which a free market can work. Most importantly, it has not tried to direct the economic activities of the colony. No government official is telling these people what to do. They're free to buy from whom they want, to sell to whom they want, to work for whom they want. Sometimes it looks like chaos, and so it is. But underneath, it's highly organized by the impersonal forces of a free marketplace. The impersonal forces of a free marketplace at work back here in the United States. Hey, two broccoli, a dollar, a quarter. Prices are the key. The prices that people are willing to pay for products determines what's produced. The prices that have to be paid for raw materials, for the wages of labor and so on, determine the cheapest way to produce these things. And in addition, these self-same prices, the wages of labor, the interest on capital and so on, determine how much each person has to spend on the market. It's tempting to try to separate this final function of prices from the other two. To think that somehow or other you can use prices to transmit the information about what should be produced and how it should be produced without using those prices to determine how much each person gets. Indeed, government activity over the past few decades has been devoted to little else. But that's a very serious mistake. If what people get is not going to be determined on what they produce, on how they produce it, on how successfully they work, what incentive is there for them to act in accordance with the information that's transmitted? There's only one alternative, force. Some people telling other people what to do. Nice. Oh, boy, look what I got. Real good tomato. Real nice. Hey, come on, try one of those tomatoes here. Don't eat home anymore. Have free lunch over here. You eat for nothing over here. Well, Eddie, if we don't charge you, have a free lunch. I know, I'm going to. That's right. Free lunch, free lunch. The fundamental principle of a free society is voluntary cooperation. The economic market, buying and selling, is one example. But it's only one example. Voluntary cooperation is far broader than that. To take an example, that at first sight seems about as far away as you can get. The language we speak, 
the words we use, the complex structure of our grammar. No government bureau designed that. It arose out of the voluntary interactions of people seeking to communicate with one another. Or consider some of the great scientific achievements of our time, the discoveries of Einstein or a Newton, the inventions of a Thomas Alva Edison or an Alexander Graham Bell, or even consider the great charitable activities of a Florence Nightingale or an Andrew Carnegie. These weren't done under orders from a government office. They were done by individuals deeply interested in what they were doing, pursuing their own interests and cooperating with one another. This kind of voluntary cooperation is built so deeply into the structure of our society that we tend to take it for granted. Yet the whole of our Western civilization is the unintended consequence of that kind of a voluntary cooperation, of people cooperating with one another to pursue their own interests, yet in the process building a great society. I'm Linda Chavez. Welcome to Free to Choose. Joining Dr. Friedman in a discussion of the power of the market are David Brooks of the Wall Street Journal and James Galbraith of the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Galbraith, should we follow the example of Hong Kong and simply allow an unregulated free market? I think we do better in this country uh, with the combination of uh, a free market and its advantages uh, and a well regulated, carefully thought out structure of uh, government, which provides uh, a chance to uh, uh, pick up some of the losers from the market process and give them a second start, provides us with a chance to make the economic process a little safer, a little healthier, a little more environmentally uh, sound and protective than you might get from uh, a uh, uh, strict adherence to the free market, such as uh, Professor Friedman has described in the case of, of Hong Kong. Dr. Friedman, is there any such thing as a well-regulated market? No. He's begging the question. Obviously, he's right. If you could have a well-regulated, carefully thought out, properly done market, benevolent dictatorship is the best of all forms of government. Oh, I don't agree with that at all. Neither do constitutional I. Constitutional democracy is the best of I, all forms of government. No, constitutional democracy <coughs> is the least bad of all forms of government. But uh, you beg all the that's questions a, a when you talk about well-regulated, carefully thought out. If you look at the actual programs that government follows, they almost always have effects that the, are the opposite of those that, that uh, were intended by their well-meaning advocates. Let me tell you what troubles me. I'll tell me. you something. Matching the invisible hand of government is the uh, invisible hand of the market is the invisible foot of government. You make the point in the, in the program that uh, in every case where you have uh, a smaller role of government, the freer market, you have a higher standard of living. The no, same I point. didn't say that. At the same I didn't say that. Well, I that said you are have better conditions for the poorer people. Better okay. conditions, okay, better conditions for the poorer people, fine, I'll accept that. At the same time, you're making the argument in the program that the uh, conditions in Hong Kong are better, for example, than they are in the United States, mm -hmm. which is manifestly not true. I mean, we I do have, we do, you are the making the argument, you're making the on argument the that Hong Kong is more free than it we is. are. It is more free. Does it then follow that the conditions for poor people in Hong Kong are better than they are in the United States? We have to, we have to. That I don't, I, that I don't I, believe I to I said true. in there where you compare like with like. That's well, now, okay, well, this is an important qualification, yeah, which said, isn't clear Hong in the program. Kong, uh, obviously, started mm -hmm. out from a much lower position. If I were to compare Hong Kong, conditions in Hong Kong, in 1945 or 1950, with conditions in the United States in 1820, 1830, you'd have a much closer comparison. But are you then saying, a uh, position which I would find much more congenial, that where you have a country which has developed a base of material wealth, uh, a degree of comfort for the average citizen, that it is then legitimate for the government of that country to step in and provide some guarantees and some security no, for poor people and old no people sorry. and sick people. No, I am people. not saying that at all. But why not? I mean, what, what, what's because wrong I am with, saying with that as a, as a Because as a, every as a time a they step position. in to try to do that, they end up doing the opposite. Well, this discussion uh, takes up uh, or reflects a, a feature of the program that I found 
to be most troubling, which is a failure to make a distinction between governments of the kind that we have developed in this country over 200 years uh, and governments of the kind that you described in, uh, in, in uh, the People's Republic of China. Uh, it's perfectly clear that one can have, uh, and many countries do have, the curse of repressive dictatorships. It's also perfectly clear that an economy that's organized by commissars is going to fail. And we certainly have, have, have seen the, uh, in, laid out before us over the last several years, the ashes of uh, those failed economies. But is it possible to take the example of the Soviet Union, of Poland, of Hungary, uh, and to say because their governments, which were after all uh, dictatorships modeled after, uh, after the system of government installed in the Soviet Union by Stalin, are in fact parallel to the actions of our government, which is a government which operates on many different federal levels, and where fundamentally what you have is the ability of the ordinary citizen whose power is not weighted by the amount of money he has or she has to use the vote wow. in order there to in order to in order to to make some collective decisions. Now, granted, there are thirty-four hundred pages in the years, Clean Air Act. What, where's granted, the citizen in there? Granted, after ten years of uh, of uh, uh, Reagan's Washington, you've got a problem of uh, of uh, a serious problem of corruption. Uh, well, and and, and in, our, in our democratic no, system, no, does that mean that we should <laughs> abandon the <laughs> idea that you have uh, a democratic process uh, that should be entrusted with certain important decisions? You, I don't think you so. You don't have a democratic process in the sense in which you mean it. Uh, we have a democracy. We have a majority mm -hmm. rule. But the majority that rules is a collection of minorities. It's a collection of special interests. You cannot tell me that the consumers of this country would vote for a sugar quota that makes the price of sugar three times the world price. When you say you can't compare it to Russia, or to, you're quite right, but the, only because they are 100% and we're 50%. You're, you're if, right. our, if our system, if our present regulations and rules had prevailed, if our scope of government had prevailed 100 years ago, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be where we are today. Let me understand you, Dr. Friedman. Do you believe that there should be no role at all whatsoever for government? Of course there should be a role for government. There's what a is that role? It's a very important role for government. The role for government is, first of all, to protect people from coercion by the physical coercion by their neighbors or by foreign countries. It is to protect the national defense and to protect law and order in the, at home. There's a role for government in enabling us to have a mechanism whereby we decide on the rules by which we want to run. What, how we define private property, what we mean by private property. There's a role for government in adjudicating disputes between us. There is a role for government, a very important role. And I believe our government played that role quite well for about 100 years until the uh, Great Depression. I'd go a little further. I think there is a health and safety role as well. The, the problem is you have, to, you have to keep your regulations simple and minimal. You have to realize that there are, there are costs, and often the costs outweigh the benefits. In fact, in Washington, there are interests who want to divert costs to themselves. So there's sort of a built-in structure, a dynamic, to, to make costs outweigh the benefits. Well, we're making progress here. I would add that there's a role, the government has a role to protect the environment. I would say the government has a role to set standards for products but what in areas where information is very costly well, for the individual consumer to obtain. Uh, I like very much the fact that the steaks that that dentist was eating were inspected by the USDA. Their purity was guaranteed by a rather well-functioning uh, uh, aspect of, the, uh, of, of our government. Uh, I like... Go ahead. On the other hand, you've got the FDA, which has these long delays, 10 years to get a drug approved. So the, the effect is that you have to be a big drug company to, to get any kind of, to enter the market. And you, you basically are closing off the market. Uh, on the other hand, you have, you've had a set of regulations which uh, have disappeared without uh, any well-justified regrets. For example, the regulations or, or that govern the entry into interstate trucking, the regulations that govern entry and, and, and rates in and airlines. And incidentally, that was done under the Reagan administration. No, 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 no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Those reforms were done under the Carter administration. Yeah. They, they were started under the Carter the, administration. They were, and they, under the Reagan oh, they were not. They were stalled it, it under the Reagan really administration. Matter, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't really matter. No, it does matter a great deal. The question of who, who favors these things and on what merits. But, uh, There's no doubt that Carter did the heavy lifting on deregulation. Thank you. 
But in any event, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not trying to defend one political party or another. Mm -hmm. uh, as David says, a major enemy of a free market is a business interest. The business community is a major enemy. Uh, and uh, the problem in the society is to have the public at large understand the importance of free markets so as to protect themselves against the depredations of the business community with their tariffs, their quotas, uh, their special uh, provisions, and so on. But if you come to all of these good things that society is supposed to do, you have to look at how many of them have been perverse in their influences and in their effect. You mentioned the FDA, and that's a very important case because that's caused tens of thousands of lives over the course of time because of the document. Oh, the evidence has been... Go ahead. I mean, you can start with the AIDS virus, where the FDA tries again. Re recently, there have been reforms, but they were very slow to let people, even people who, who knew they were going to die and were, were going to die without any drug to try experimental drugs. Uh, let but me ask another clear. question. You'd have to establish that those experimental drugs would have, in fact, saved their lives. They couldn't have done worse. Effect. They were going to die. Let me give you another hypothetical. What if you have a social need, say a disease which is uh, very lethal but affects very few people, and you don't have a company who has an interest because it's not going to make very much money, there's not a large market for uh, the good to produce uh, a drug. Uh, does the government have any role there to step in to try and stimulate uh, certain social purposes? Uh, it's hard for me, for me to imagine. I, I, I can't imagine how the government would in the first place. Uh, but in any event, you must realize that government isn't the only recourse. Yeah. The great period, when, were, when, when uh, were the nonprofit hospitals of the United States founded? Almost all of them were in the 19th century during the heyday of laissez-faire. Uh, there are charitable, private charitable activities, which are essentially the most effective way of handling the kind of things you've described. Yeah, right. A little bit of faithfulness to history surely would cause you to concede that in 1937 when we inaugurated Social Security, in 1965 when we inaugurated Medicare, we did so because the private charitable systems, the private insurance systems to care for people when they were old and when they were sick were failing in a gross way to meet the needs of the American people. And those programs, which are government programs, uh, have at least had the virtue of extending the access to, uh, to health care and extending uh, income security when you're old to a very, very large part of the population that never had it before. And I would, well, I would well, argue, too, that in addition to the regulatory functions and the uh, judicial functions that we, we certainly agree on, uh, that there is a, 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 in a, in a rich society which can afford to take care of people who uh, uh, we fall out of the market process. We weren't lucky or, or gifted or uh, uh, fortunate in their economic uh, uh, lives to take care of those people when they are old but and when they are sick. But what about the extent to which you're the same society that you describe, the same logic that you describe, makes them poor? What about the minimum wage, which prevents many people from getting employment? What about uh, the rent controls which destroy housing in the cities. And you're, lo you're trying yeah, to look at minimum, the minimum yeah, the, Beginning to I, switch over, I, yeah. uh, you can point to the minimum wage, which yeah. everybody agrees increases unemployment among the poor especially. But what about the environment? The I, I mean, if you, have a, uh, well, uh, if, right. if you have a simple environmental law, I mean, the reason the West is cleaner than the East, the Eastern Bloc, is the main reason is we're richer. And we can afford to Absolutely. do it. Uh, the problem, so far as the environment is concerned, the real function of the government is to uh, define the property rights. And it is quite clear that if, if I force you to take bad water for good water, well, then I ought to, I ought to pay you. Uh, I'm not quarreling with that. But if you look at the actual environmental measures that government takes, they often have harmful effects and not positive effects. Well, the new clean air bill that has yeah. just been passed, for example, is going to cost an enormous amount of money. Well, nobody knows how much. And, that's and, what, and, that's and in principle, rules. of course, your argument is uh, uh, one which many economists are sympathetic to, and I have some sympathy for it. But the technical facts of environmental control are such that it is often very, very costly to define the property rights in a way in which you can uh, generate a, an efficiently functioning market. That is why is. you don't have it's a privately time. organized market. It's the information cost of those transactions is extremely high. So in some cases, what you want to have the government do is say, if there is mercury in the water, you find out who's putting it in and you shut but the But let's look at and what the government... That's a reasonable way to proceed because 
the alternative is extremely costly. But let's look at what the government actually does. In the United States today, the federal government spends an amount of money which is 25% of the national income. State and local governments spend an additional 17% of the national income. That's 42% altogether. Now, some of that is doing good, of course. It would be very hard to spend that amount of money. But an enormous amount of that is simply uh, taking money from some and giving it to others, and very often taking it from poor and giving it to well-to-do. Right, a lot you're, you're of it is of course, Social Security in that, which is taking money from the payroll tax, from working people, and transferring it to whole, the On the whole, so far as Social Security is concerned, the people who pay are poorer than the people who benefit. Gentlemen, we are out of time. Thank you for watching Free to Choose. Next week, we'll be discussing what happens when government enters the marketplace. When anyone complains about unfair competition, consumers beware. That is really a cry for special privilege, always at the expense of the consumer. What we need in this country is free competition.